Hi TYT, it's Katie Halper. I'm really excited to bring you an interview that I did on Wednesday, May 16th with Kara Eastman, a day after Kara Eastman won her primary in Nebraska's second district where she defeated Brad Ashford. Brad Ashford is a blue dog Democrat, a more conservative Democrat, much more establishment Democrat. He was endorsed by the DCCC. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee wanted to just prepare you that the audio quality and video quality isn't great. I really want to talk to Kara, so that meant that I did it from my apartment over Skype and there are some technical issues, especially when Kara talks to me about how her mom's cancer affected her and her politics and when her mom passed away. So thank you so much for your patience and we will see you next time. We're so happy to be speaking to Kara Eastman right now. Congratulations. There's a lot to be talking about because this is a very exciting and significant election. And can you just tell us about what happened last night? Well, last night, uh, we won our primary. Uh, it was a tight race for sure, but we worked really hard. And in the end, uh, we won by about 3%. So I'm really proud of that accomplishment. Or three, per- three points. Three points, right. So how many vo- votes was that more or less? It's about 1,000. And tell us about why you even got involved in this race in the first place. What made you enter into politics? Well, I, I am an elected official. I was elected to our board of governors of our community college three years ago. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I was thinking about Congress. I decided to run because of my mom. Uh, in 2016, my mother had been diagnosed with cancer for the fifth time. I'm an only child. I was raised by a single mom. And uh, as we were having a conversation about her medical bills, she mentioned there was a, a drug that her doctor had prescribed to her that was $2,500 for one single pill. And I had to stop and say, what are you, what, are you crazy? Like, who could afford to pay that for a pill? How can a pill be that expensive? And uh, that was in addition to the $800 she was already paying for prescription drugs. And that was with Medicare. And that just seemed unbelievable to me. And really what's happened throughout this campaign is, it, it, this isn't about my mom anymore. My mom mother actually nine months ago and without that pill she wasn't able to leave the house thanks and uh, wasn't able to be there for my campaign kickoff but um, the reality is there are so many people in this district so many people in the country that are faced with these exorbitant prices for their medications and uh, I decided that perhaps somebody like me a social worker somebody who had run a nonprofit my whole career I've been working in social service and public service that maybe somebody like me could get in. I've, I've been working on policy. I've raised $13 million to invest in safe, healthy housing for our kids in our community in Omaha. Um, I've developed public-private partnerships, formed coalitions to solve problems, and that maybe a social worker could get into this race and uh, do some good, because I think we need people who can make sane, sound decisions for the country, and we also need people who are about people. Right, yeah, I was gonna say, so you have the background of working with and caring for people as a social worker, and that's something that, you know, as right. opposed to, let's say, Donald Trump, who, who is our president, whose background is in being a businessman and a ruthless businessman. Uh, it's kind of the other side of the spectrum in terms of uh, how you relate to people. So it's a great, I think it's a, it's a really good qualification. And I, I heard um, your interview with Cenk Uger on the Young Turks, and you mentioned also that your mother was an artist and that so one of the things she didn't wasn't able to do was see your daughter's art show yeah my daughter is 16 and she's an artist like my mom and uh it's been just increasingly more disappointing that my mom wasn't able to as as sabina's gotten older to see her art shows or be a part of that because my mom would absolutely be so proud of her i'm an only child too it's hard obviously for everyone everyone suffers when their parents are ill or when they die but it's also really hard as an only child because it's like you know it's just you and the parents exactly yeah anyway but i'm sorry um but i'm also really thrilled though that you are one step closer to helping make a country where people won't face those problems and they won't face exorbitant prices when they're trying to survive um and it's it's incredible that you know to remember that we live in such a a wealthy country and that Mm -hmm. these are the types of things that people have to um you know life and death situations so can you tell us how that that um you know the your mother's situation your situation the situation of other people uh suffering how that has shaped your campaign's uh goals and your platform 
Sure. Well, we've been, I mean, the other part of the campaign that has been so important to me as coming from an organizing background or a, a community background is just making sure that we're actually talking to people and honestly, more important that we're listening to them. So what we found in the over 60,000 doors that we've knocked in the campaign is that the number one thing people are talking about is healthcare. And when we ask them what their concerns are, they talk about their drug prices, their access to medical care, not having a medical home, um, having to travel distances, even in an urban area to find adequate health care. And, uh, and, and people talking a lot lately about how a, a drug one day costs a certain amount, and then a couple of weeks later, it's a completely different amount, a lot more. I was talking to one person who said they had a, a pill that was $8, and then the next week they went back to get it, it was $200, with no rationale for that, no reasoning. We, it's interesting that we never get a menu of, of how much these things cost. We don't get a list. Um, I'm somebody that has been fighting my whole career I, for people. I have worked uh, in homeless and domestic violence shelters. I started a national volunteer program for people with Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, for the last 12 years, I've been building a nonprofit that, that I started uh, that's around children's environmental health. And so I know firsthand what people experience when it comes to their health and their health issues. But the reality is healthcare is and should be a right. What else did you discover were issues that matter to people? The other thing people talk a lot about is education and especially student debt. And I'm, a, I'm on the board of governors of our community college. I serve as the vice chair there and see a lot of students that are either struggling to be able to even afford our community college, which is the cheapest game in town, probably one of the highest quality educations as well. But um, and, and just drowning in student loan debt. This is something that is crippling us as a nation. It's crippling our workforce. It's crippling our national security. And it's something that we need to address and we need to address it now because we need to be competitive in a global economy and make sure that students are not coming out of college, um, drowning in debt, or that they're not going to college because of the costs. And what is the difference between you and your primary opponent? What are some of the key differences? Well, um, I mean, he has he had a lot of experience in the legislative business. He was in the Nebraska State Senate. He served one term in Congress. I believe our, our core differences are in uh, some of the policies and positions that he took when he was in Congress. So he voted against uh, the against DACA, against passage of the Affordable Care Act, against the Clean Power Plan against the Iran nuclear deal. He voted for the Keystone Pipeline. When he was in the Nebraska state legislature, he voted against uh, some choice measures, some women's reproductive health measures. I He was the Democrat that was fourth most likely to vote with Republicans when he was in Congress. And that was framed as bipartisanship or working across the aisle, but he voted so much with Republicans on very key bills that he did it was disappointing to us as Democrats. Right. And uh, I'm somebody that is also willing to work with different people, people across, reach across the aisle to get things done. But I'm also going to stand up for the values of the people of the district and, and my own values and my own convictions. Right. Yeah, and what we're finding more and more is that these issues that, that people used to consider kind of too fringe or, or, t or t politically toxic issues, these are positions, whether it's affordable health care or uh, college tuition issues, these are issues that have mass support. And, you know, the media and politicians like to pretend that they're these, these kind of weird positions to have and unrealistic and no one's going to win an election with them. But what we're seeing more and more is that these are the things that actually get people out of the House to vote. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. And yeah, some of the things that you support besides uh, Medicare for All uh, is overturning Citizens United, raising taxes on corporations, uh, decriminalizing marijuana, and um, universal background checks. Of course, you know, the resistance, the anti-Trump resistance, as it should, it talks a lot about how, how terrible Trump's position on immigration is. And you mentioned that um, Ashford opposed DACA. We want to think that Democrats are going to be running on the right side of, of, of history and the right side of issues. Democrats aren't just going to beat Trump by saying they're not Trump. They actually have to, you know, put out good proposals and support good proposals. Again, the, the DCCC did endorse Ashford, your primary opponent. So I, it would be great if they, if they kind of woke up to, to which 
to the issues that get people to, to vote for their party um, mm-hmm. and hopefully actually support you in this because you are the Democratic candid- uh, candidate right now. And in theory, you know, the Democrats should be fighting for their party. So, um, yeah. I have confidence that that will happen. <laughs> okay, good, good. Just making sure. You're on notice, DCCC. Um, <laughs> some more st- established feminist organizations, pro-choice organizations, individuals who were uh, justifiably concerned about, wanted to make sure that uh, Heath Mello, who was running for mayor of Omaha, they wanted to make sure he was going to be pro-choice and really respect and fight for reproductive rights, and he, he said he would. Uh, he was running against uh, an anti-choice um, mayor of Omaha. Mm-hmm. He lost to uh, that mayor. There was a lot of discussion about that. And, and so it was a little bit, I think, surprising and disappointing to some of us to see that many of those people who do work hard for reproductive uh, rights and have done a lot for, the, for women in this country um, and around the world, actually, in some cases, that they didn't seem to, to pay as much attention to your race or they chose not to endorse. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that they will now, especially now that you've proven your bona fides in, in winning this very um, competitive race. Do you, what, what are your expectations and hopes with, with the, these organizations? Well, we have had groups reach out to us today. Um, I'm not exactly sure which one because my inbox is full and <laughs> we've been going, going, going all day. But uh, but I'm I'm hopeful and confident that these groups will support me because our values are aligned and uh, we need to unite and just move forward together. But the reality is we managed to pull this off with no corporate PAC money, actually very little PAC money at all. Um, these We had, I think, about 5,000 individual donors donations to the campaign, a lot of small dollar donations, and with the help of some of the groups that did get involved, like I said, like the Justice Democrats, the PCCC, the Working Families Party, we were able to raise the money to be competitive in this race. That's pretty remarkable for someone like me who's not a millionaire, uh, somebody who doesn't have that the backing of the party. Um, I remember a consultant saying to me, well, just pull out your Rolodex and go through that, that first. That's, that's how you fundraise. And I said, well, I did that, and my Rolodex includes nonprofit leaders who did give me the twenty or fifty dollars that they could afford. Right. Um, but uh, I'm and I'm grateful for all of that support. But it's challenging to do this as a non-millionaire. It's challenging to do this as a as a political outsider, um, and and it's one of the things that I think needs to be fixed. We need to get money out of politics so that regular people have an easier time time of getting into this. Yeah, so Emily's List, um, Planned Parenthood, NARAL, I'm inviting all of you to um, support this this person, this woman who's a wonderful, strong, pro-choice uh, candidate because you do ha- share values and you want the same things. And there tends to be this self-fulfilling prophecy where, where some people will look at a candidate and say, oh, that person's not viable, so we're not going to invest in that person. And then that person won't do as well because they don't have the institutional and financial backing. So then they won't win, and then they point to that loss as proof that they, that that person wasn't viable in the first place. But of course, had they actually supported that person, things would have been very different. So um, it's really great that you were able to, to win this primary. I feel like I had a, a ton of support um, nationally from groups like the PCCC, Justice Democrats, the Working Families Party, Blue America, Climate Hawks Vote, uh, Vote Pro-Choice, and uh, so I... I'm really proud of those endorsements that we had. Locally, I had four local unions that supported me, 11 elected officials. There was an outpouring of support just from regular people. I mean, we had so many volunteers, young people coming out to work really hard, people that said they had never been engaged in a political campaign before. And so I, I, I felt supported along the way. Uh, where were you watching the, the results come in? We had actually a really big party um, at uh, a place in Omaha called the Field Club, and uh, it was incredible and also a little strange because there, there were so many people there, and to be watching results come in in a crowded room with a band and um, and with friends and family and colleagues because it was such a roller coaster last night. It was it was a little strange, I'll be honest, but uh, but in the end, it was amazing to have that room filled with so many people who were so excited. I, I had one person come up to me and say. Uh, he had just moved here from Iowa, and that it gave him hope that there would be a voice for, for him in Congress. He's a young gay man. And so I just felt like that that was incredibly telling. My field team, I have the best field team in Nebraska, 
and to see their faces, they were crying and screaming and so excited that we had accomplished this together. So pretty amazing. Yeah. How late did you need to stay up to see the results? Uh, we were up until I think uh, about 11 or 12 to see the final results. And then uh, I think we, we all came back to the house. My, my daughter was there with us the whole time. She's 16 and some of her friends were there. My husband was there with me by my side the whole time and talking to people. He was pretty nervous too. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was an incredible night and, uh, it's, uh, I'm still recovering. <laughs> yeah. How confident were you? We knew that it would be close because we had the data from talking to people at the doors and making phone calls. I mean, we had made so many calls and knocked so many doors. That's all I did last week was knock on people's doors. There was a lot of support for me, but there were a lot of people that were undecided and people still trying to figure out how viable is somebody who's new to this game? Um, how do I, do I vote for somebody who I don't know? Or when I have this established politician that's been working in Nebraska and he's done some good stuff in Nebraska. But ultimately, I'm uh, happy to say that that we prevailed. And uh, I'm also I'm fluent in Spanish, and so I was able to go into the Latino parts of the community and talk to people and make phone calls to them as well. And uh, so I'm hoping that perhaps that was one of the things that made a made a uh, difference in this campaign. Obviously, being able to speak to people in their native language helps quite a bit. And what do you have to say to people who who are inevitably will say, oh, but uh, you know. Nebraska is such a, a red state. Uh, how you have no chance of winning. Uh, all the all the kind of usual suspect right. responses that you get. What's your what's your response to those? Well, we have been a blue dot in this district. We gave an electoral college vote to Obama in two thousand and eight. So this is a very winnable district. Uh, the narrative here is is usually we need to run a conservative Democrat to win, and then they don't win. And so what we're finding is that. And a, a Democrat who's standing up for the values of the people in the district can win. And the thing that we saw last night that was pretty interesting was that turnout was up. It was doubled from 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really important. We have not really been able to ignite the base before. Um, and I think this campaign has done that and will continue to do that. And wh- why do you think it was able to do that? Um, one, because we knocked on people's doors and talked to them. Yeah. But also the, the message of the campaign, the strong positive message about fighting for healthcare, education, the environment. Um, we live in an environmental disaster with the Superfund site here, and that's something I've been working to resolve for a long time. So I know firsthand what an environmental contamination looks like for a community. Therefore, I'm against the Keystone Pipeline. The majority of people I talk to are as well. Uh, these are things, and, and, and in particular the economy, where you've got on, on uh, right now what we hear is like oh, the economy is booming, uh, employment, uh, unemployment is down, people's, um, people got all these bonuses, right? When we talk to people at the doors, they're saying they're struggling, that people are working two or three jobs to be able to feed their families, and that they're not feeling the effects of this. and. Uh, and that they know that this tax bill actually benefits the very wealthy and large corporations more than it does them. So uh, we're, we're just going to keep doing what we've been doing, and uh, and I think it's it's uh, exciting, and I think that's really what's going to ignite people to come out when they feel like they've got somebody who's actually going to represent them, represent their values, and someone who's accessible. I heard from a lot of people that the reason they voted for me was because I returned their phone calls or answered back their Facebook messages and that they felt like that was a new new model that they could actually interact with somebody who was running. And even though there were a lot of difficult conversations, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge, I think, because we don't always agree on everything, but we have to be able to have those difficult conversations and come to some kind of uh, at least uh, common ground, find common ground where we can and work together to solve problems. Can you sh- shed some light on um, like what the takeaways for other progressives um, who are running for, you know, running for Congress or running in other races, what are the takeaways for them? Well, look, I mean, look, I, I won one primary, and so I don't want to be that person that's out there saying, well, now I'm going to show everybody else how to do this. It's like moms when they have one kid and then they think they're experts, um, <laughs> which maybe they are on some right. level. But as, uh, as an only child, I like to think they stopped at perfection after one kid. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I, I think that being able to uh, answer questions directly, have difficult conversations with people, um, 
I don't, I can't say what answers have worked and what haven't, but like, I've just been really honest with people about what I know and what I don't know, where I can draw from expertise that I have. I'm really lucky to be pretty tied into the nonprofit community in Omaha, where we have a ton of expertise to draw from. And, uh, and I've had people on the campaign helping me along the way, experts in the farm bill, ex experts in agriculture, experts in the military, experts in veteran affairs. Um, so that w where there are areas of expertise that maybe I haven't directly worked, I know where to go to find that. And, uh, and so I would just say, I think being authentic is really important. It's uh, We promised our daughter that when we launched the campaign that I would not put winning ahead of integrity. And, and I feel like we've we have we've done that. We haven't done anything that we weren't proud of, and that's how we like. We will continue the campaign that way. I believe civility is important in anything, and in particular in politics. And can you tell us about moving forward what your what the race will be like? What the major differences between you and your um, opponent in the general will be? Well, so he is a Republican. He uh, he's in his first term in Congress. And uh, his voting record has been 97.3% with the president. So uh, he voted to take away health care. He voted for the border wall that we don't need and can't afford and isn't the correct solution to any problems around immigration. Um, he also voted for the tax bill proudly. And uh, what I'm hearing from people in the district, and this is, we've been knocking doors of Democrats, but there are a lot of Republicans inside those homes. And, People are telling, and there are a lot of independents in the district as well, people are telling us they're disappointed in those votes. They feel like they don't represent their values. Right. It's interesting to look at today's headlines. You have, um, who is Cara Eastman, first time female candidate, stuns Democratic establishment, and then Nebraska's primaries. That was at Newsweek. For the Huffington Post, pro-abortion rights progressive wins Nebraska Democratic House primary. CNBC has Nebraska primary results. GOP cheers Dem. Kara Eastman win over Ashford. So people are already trying to frame this as a something that Republicans are, are happy about. Um, the suggestion being that you are much more uh, beatable than your primary opponent. And what? how do you respond to that? I mean, look, we have so much energy and we have ignited this space so much. People are really excited right now. And I think we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to go out and talk to independents who tend to lean a little to the left anyway. We have an opportunity to talk to moderate Republican women. Um, women are performing really well around the country. But I think most importantly, we need leadership that is engaged and uh, listening to the voters and being willing to, to engage in these conversations and representing the values of the people of this district. So. If we manage to put together this scrappy insurgent campaign and beat somebody that was the establishment uh, Democrat in the race, I can just imagine what we're going to accomplish in the general election. Right. And of course, I'm sure the same people who are making this argument were the same people who thought you would never have a chance to win. So yeah, I'm, not sure, right? I'm not sure how, what, how good their prediction uh, record is. Another headline, this one was CNN, Democrats anti-Trump resistance scores a big primary win in Nebraska. Oh, Vox had Cara Eastman, Medicare for All Progressive, wins Nebraska has primary. Uh, yeah, this is, I think, a kind of a, hopefully a watershed moment. Uh, it, and it's part of, I think, this trend that we're seeing of insurgent candidates who are not part of the establishment. They're not necessarily the usual suspects or the likely candidates. Um, how, how much were you inspired by Bernie Sanders? Well, I'm, I'm a fan of Senator Sanders. I think a lot of the proposals that he have, has out there are makes sense um and and but i i'm inspired by a lot of of politicians um nationally and locally we have some great people here on the ground in omaha that are doing work for the community i have the honor of working with uh, state senator tony vargas who is the first latino elected to the nebraska state legislature i'm uh, have the honor of working with the president of the city council ben gray and these are people who endorsed me throughout this race so um, I think I think Nebraska could teach a lot of other places how to do some stuff, and we're often looked at as a flyover state. Or uh, people ask, "Where is Omaha? Is that in uh, Oklahoma?" Right. <laughs> um, but uh, Omaha is a pretty interesting place. This district is is amazing, and uh, it's it's ninety six percent urban. So I think that's something that people don't necessarily think of when they think of Nebraska. But um, 
but we could be major players in a lot of things. We could be champions in wind and solar energy. Uh, we at the community college here, Metropolitan Community College, where I'm on the board, is an incredible institution, one of the top 10 community colleges in the country. We're doing stuff every day that I'm just completely amazed by. So I think there are models here that I've been involved with or that we have that we could bring to other places in the country. And are there any organizations in particular you're hoping to um, see endorse you? I mean, I don't know if has our I don't know if our revolution did. Um, I don't know if Bernie Sanders has has come out. Uh, you strike me as a very Sanders Sandersian Sandersian uh, <laughs> uh, candidate. Um, well, it's funny to say that he did call me this morning. <laughs> oh my gosh! Wow, how yep. was it? Nice yeah. chat. It was very nice. Yeah, he called to congratulate me and said he heard that I upset the Democratic establishment, which I <laughs> told wow. him, I think he paved the way for somebody yeah. like me to be able to do that. <laughs> Were you able to talk to him, or did he leave a message? Or I did talk to him. It was brief, but... Uh, That's great. Well, he's busy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing call. My daughter was very excited about that call as well. She actually she actually answered the phone oh, when nice. they called to play with him, so that was pretty cool. I was, so was she excited when she told you he had called? Yeah. Was she like, <laughs> very excited. <laughs> exactly. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so so Bernie Sanders called you, and then what about, are you hoping that Emily's List or Planned Parenthood, NARAL, any any particular, Our Revolution, anyone else you're, you're hoping to hear from? If you had a wish list of... Labor and unions are very important to me. I come from a union family, and so I'm hoping for more labor support um, because I think that my values are aligned with theirs quite a bit, especially when it comes to livable wages and safe and healthy working environments. Um, so, so those would mean a lot to me. Any of those, uh, the groups that you mentioned, I'd be happy to have the endorsement of because we want to win and we need everyone's help to do this. We're going to continue this as a grassroots movement, but the more help that we can get, the better. And what about your daughter? How, how has this affected her life? Has this uh, inspired her? I assume she's very proud of you right now. She's very proud. She's very excited. She's also tired. Right. But uh, <laughs> and and she's she's actually uh, an interesting person, if I do say so myself. I mean, aside from being an artist, she is part of the Omaha Student Union. This is a group of young people that come from different colleges and universities and high schools that have come together around politics, and she's part of that. She also works for a group called the Women's Fund and their Adolescent Health Project. So she's out in her job, um, aside from going to school, teaching other teens about STI pre prevention and sexual health. Um, so she's a pretty remarkable young woman, and really she's inspiring me. She she actually organized the March for Our Lives in Omaha. Wow, and, uh, that's great. Was one of the speakers there, yeah. So uh, so honestly, I think I'm more inspired by her. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's, it's, it's mutual. Yeah. Um, how are you gonna finish the rest of the week? How much sleep do you have to catch up on? Sleep would be good. I, that's a magical thing I keep hearing about, so I'm excited to sleep. Um, we've got some uh, meetings to have, and uh, we need to get together as a campaign team. And honestly, we need to celebrate because yeah. this is an incredible moment. It is a watershed moment, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, I'm honoring the people who work so hard on my, my team. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're just going to keep talking to people and and. And, uh, figure out how we win this because I think we have the blueprint already and we have the people in place and uh, we've, I've had so many people reach out to me today saying they want to get involved and uh, so it's exciting and I can't wait to see what's next. Great, the non-blue dog blueprint. You can uh, use that <laughs> as on your website. Um, and again, thank you so much Cara Eastman for talking to us at the Young Turks and you can find out more about Cara on Twitter. Cara for Congress on Twitter, EastmanForCongress.com is the website. Also, uh, check out her great interviews on the Young Turks, and also there's some great reporting on, on it that already happened. Um, and, I, I just yeah. that was the best video that I saw last night was Jenk's video when we won. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. We've shared that quite a bit today. It was, uh, that was fun. Yeah, it's, it was great. Thank you so much for joining us, and I uh, hope to speak to you soon, and wish, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Take care.